You're listening to The Voice of Russia from London. I'm Tim Eckert, and today our discussion is about the future of the publishing industry. It's easier to publish a book today than it's been at any time in history. And it's easier to buy a book than ever before. If you've got a computer, you don't even need to leave the house. Thanks to the internet and the so-called digital revolution, it's often said that anyone can now write and distribute a book. The fusty and secretive world of publishing is open to everyone. Here in Britain, the press has been full of stories recently about the author E.L. James and her book Fifty Shades of Grey, which sold over a million copies in less than three months. And it's reportedly the fastest-selling title ever downloaded via the Kindle, Amazon's electronic book reader. But many in publishing are worried. Bookshops are closing down at an unprecedented rate, and sales of printed books have been declining annually. While e-book sales continue to climb, the evidence suggests that fewer titles overall are being sold, with just a handful of high-selling titles accounting for the majority of publishing profits. According to the Publishers Association, consumer spending on printed books continues to go down, around 2% less each year since 2008. So what does the future hold? To discuss the question, I'm joined on the line by John Mitchinson, co-founder of Unbound, the world's first crowd-funded publisher, by Nicola Solomon, who's General Secretary of the Society of Authors, and here in the studio we have Max Bollinger, Chief Creative Officer and Publisher with Interactive Media, and Jonathan Rupin, who's the web editor with Foils, one of London's most famous bookshops. I'll just go round the table uh, and down the phone lines uh, briefly. Um, is this a time to be joyous about publishing or a time to be depressed? Max Bollinger. Well, that's a very good question and thank you for giving me this first opportunity to speak here. It is both, really. It's a bit of both um, because there are great challenges. Technologically, it's, it's an exciting time and um, for those publishers who are very good with technology, um, the world is their oyster, really. But for for those who are only focused on paperbacks and hardbacks and the legacy formats, I, I guess it's pretty depressing because the sales, as you mentioned, are going down, and this is very much the case. Um, younger people read less and less um, when it comes to paper books. But interestingly, um, I, I've got a very interesting bit of statistic. There was a research conducted recently here in the UK, and um, college students were given... Um, um, textbooks in the form of ebook, and at the end of this um, research, pretty much everyone, um, all of the college students, they suggested that they would prefer a paper book um, to ebook. Okay, One so little bit of good news. Yes, um, for those. Jonathan Rupin from Foils, you're at the heart of uh, what we'd call the traditional book selling uh, business. Time to be happy or a time to be depressed? No, I don't think there's. Uh, there are too many reasons to be hugely concerned about the future of books generally. I mean, the the ebook is a, obviously a new phenomenon, but uh, the mistake is to think of it as somehow um, damaging books um, the best way to think of it is another format I mean the paperback was considered revolutionary 70 years ago uh, that was going to do all sorts of harm to the industry it hasn't and e-books are just another way of another way of reading books uh, John Mitchinson uh, co-founder and publisher at Unbound I mean you've started a new model of publishing presumably because you didn't think the traditional model was working the problem really is that the the, the, the traditional model is and has been for a long time uh, wasteful. Um, it doesn't bring readers and writers directly together in the way that I think now people expect, producers and consumers expect to be brought together. Um, but uh, in terms of the overall sort of future of, of reading and books, this is, this is a golden age, you know, 150 um, literary festivals in the UK, 80,000 book groups. Um, I think there's evidence that, that that people are downloading across a, a greater range than they might uh, might, have, might have been expected at first. Um, you say you say it's a golden age, uh, John Mitchinson, but Nicola Solomon from the Society of Authors, what can you tell us about how your members are feeling? My concern isn't about authors having readers for their work, it's about authors having markets for their work, i.e. how they're actually going to be paid for it. And that's clearly much more concerning. The traditional model under which someone publishes their work and they get paid a percentage is clearly crumbling. And we need to make sure that any of the new models 
make enough remuneration in them for authors for authors to be able to continue writing. Isn't that the problem? Um, I put it to you, um, Jonathan Rupin from Foils, um, that yes, it may be a golden age for publishers, but the authors are getting squeezed out of the market, aren't they? It's getting harder for them to get decent advances from publishers. It's getting harder for them to get physical books out there. And it's all very well for the books to be published in an easily downloadable form, but the revenues accruing to the authors are smaller than they've ever been. That's certainly true from what I've read, that, that, that uh, there are fewer and fewer authors who are uh, making a, a living by writing. But to be honest, that's always been the case. I worked for a literary agent about 10 years ago. They had about 150 authors on their books. This was before the age of e-books. And I reckon about four of them made enough money from uh, writing alone uh, to, to, to make a living. Um, so unfortunately, it, 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 I think it has always been the case that it is very difficult to make a uh, a living by writing alone. There are always going to be exceptions, certain writers who will who will rake in a fortune. Um, but it's an art, and art and business, unfortunately, don't necessarily mesh very well. Max Bollinger from Interactive Media, you're in the business. Are you treating your authors well? I try to do my best, and um, and I have to say, um, what I've heard here today is all very much true. And and what happens, it's all down to individual case, and and you know, it's all fa you know fashions and um, public tastes. Um, it all changes so quickly now that traditional model simply ca cannot keep keep up with these changing, ever fast changing uh, fashions and tastes and demands from the readers. There's this general trend of expecting that information and um, entertainment is free now. It comes with this great um, electronic revolution with companies like Google and Facebook that offer all these services for free. So as a result, um, readers are now expecting books to be, if not free, um, much cheaper. And to some extent, I actually understand that because technologically, once the the ebook business um, model is set up correctly, it doesn't actually cost publishers as much to produce books as it costs um, compared to the legacy paperback formats and the stocking and insurance status. So, so there is a bit of um, rationale in that and, and I think readers are putting a lot of pressure on publishers to get their act together and do this. I don't see the death of paper book at all. Um, I, but I do see that the paper book will become more of a luxury item for those who really appreciate uh, feeling the paper, the pages, and this physical experience with the paper book. And as a result, I expect that those will cost a lot more. Um, because, yeah. Let me bring in John Mitchinson, because isn't that part of the idea behind your new venture, Unbound? You want to produce uh, beautifully made books and expect people to pay a little bit more for them essential part of our model. The three, the three founders of Unbound, we're all authors. We started this for, with, with the, the clear view of trying to find a way of making uh, writing financially rewarding for the authors that the company set up on a, on a straightforward joint venture basis. So authors get 50% of all the profits that, that, that the books make. The difference is obviously we're going directly to, to readers to, 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 to create the funds to to produce and publish those books. And yeah, the idea is that, you know, we're, we're format neutral. People can read in whatever format they want. But if you make the, the book a beautiful object, if you make it something that is, that, that, that is, you know, built to last and is printed on beautiful paper and is properly typeset and edited and, and bound, I think you're much more likely to get people to, to support a project. So they're not only getting, you know, the, the sense that they're acting as a sort of micro-patron, they're helping a, 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 an author's idea uh, find an audience. Um, they're also getting a, 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 an object that they can keep or give as a gift. Nicholas Solomon from the Society of Authors. Are we in this golden age? Um, John Mitchinson mentioned 150 literary festivals now in Britain each year, but um, I still have the sense as an author myself that the authors are um, you know, not sharing in the, the golden age, certainly in terms of their incomes. I think authors... Well, I think some authors are doing well out of the new systems and some are doing badly, and that's always been the way. Um, it is great that people are talking about reading, are interested in reading, and that there are so many outlets for it, but it is complicated to ensure that they get paid for it. And different models work for different areas. I should make it clear that society doesn't only have novelists, but we have doctors, textbook writers, ghost writers, broadcasters, all sorts. And each of those are facing changes in their traditional model. So it's a very scary, un unsettling time. Um, Jonathan Rupin, if I bring you in, uh, from Foils, a very iconic 
electronic bookshop, but a physical place where people go and browse with thousands of books on display and on offer. But you're one of the few, it would seem now, that's managing to survive in central London. We keep being told that independent bookshops particularly are closing down, but even the chains are losing uh, money. Are you confident that people will keep going into bookshops to look for a physical product? I am. I mean, one of the things about uh, online is it, it remains difficult to browse. Uh, I mean, we, we are online ourselves now. We have, we have a, a, a website with 20 million items on it now, uh, plus uh, a new e-books website. So we're investing heavily in, in the online side of things. But in terms of being a, a physical bookshop, um, I think there is still a demand for it. I do hear worrying stories about independent bookshops, but I also hear positive stories. And it is the positive stories are about those bookshops that react to their local markets and that provide a decent range of books that that people want unfortunately the chain bookstores have gone down the route of being deeply homogenous in their ranges um, and they can't compete against amazon and the supermarkets who are prepared to sell books at such a low price even at a loss uh, to gain market share um, so bookshops have got to offer something different both in terms of the range and in terms of the community experience and the events that they offer and Foils is one of those shops that I'm happy to say is flourishing in, in terms of those new requirements There are obviously lots of different business models out there and people in the business like uh, you are of trying to sell books of, of whatever type are finding that they're having to be creative but I wonder if the nature of reading is changing and whether we can talk about that um, Max Bollinger you're still publishing books in the traditional way as well as online but I always have this feeling that for a lot of us most of the time we wander into a bookshop we're not sure what we're going to buy until we find it how do you operate in the new world where people have to have an idea and they go online for most of their book buying habit well, I could probably talk for hours on trying to answer this particular question. Um, as, as we all know, um, something um, as specialist as, as books, especially when it comes to fiction novels, is a very personal experience. So what is good for one person is not good for another. So it's all a matter of tastes and fashions and um, interests that um, public and readers have um, at, a, at any given time. So in terms of addressing that, there is obviously a bit of marketing research that needs to be carried out. So um, I'm sure many other publishers, we, we all we do marketing research, we see what's going on, we need to keep up with all the latest news and information and current affairs and, um, and try and address and, and um, bring a product on the market which hopefully will be liked and will be bought. And will how, be do you, how do your readers find your books physically? Oh, okay. Well, in terms of finding physically, um, we um, work um, with um, stores like Foils. They, they also um, work very well with publishers. They, they establish direct relationships. Um, I listen to their recommendations and um, I see what, what they suggest and, and, and how people browse through their bookshop. I actually see people sitting down on the floor um, reading something and I sometimes go through and I try to... But they to need to have a bookshop in order to have that experience, Yes, that they? experience can only come from a physical bookshop. When it comes to electronic selling, it's a different world altogether. It's all about metadata, it's all about descriptions, it's all about attracting customers using electronic means, it's all about promotion. So the book that we published recently, it's a very unusual book, it's by a Russian writer who's unknown here, he's a young person. Um, he's a very talented writer, but to bring him into the British market space, it required enormous amount of effort on the side of the publisher. I had to create communities, I had to go on Facebook, on Google, I had to organize meetings with people, physical meetings, online meetings, chats, discussions. So it's a very so you complicated have to get, process. You, but you have to get people talking about the book. Uh, it's talking, it's engaging. Well, now it's become not necessarily talking, but it's engaging. And engagement can be anything. It can be in the electronic format, in the community, through Facebook. It can be directly in the bookshop. It can be through an event. Because there's so many avenues now, and all of them potentially are sales channels, potentially are where customers can be found, where people can be engaged and brought into this community it's a complex process as you say but it's this idea of so many avenues so mm. much information you talked about metadata yes. i'm sure most people don't know what that even means right but right Ni okay. Ni nicola solomon if i can bring you in do you think your authors are aware of how complex the business of getting the word out there about their books has become Yes, I think so very much. I think that people, some people are very active and understand. What's concerning, though, is the number of things that authors now have to do to get their books to market in terms of making themselves a presence, a brand, as it were. Um, 
may take away from the time they've got writing. And some people who are really good authors may not be disposed to actually sell themselves in that way. I know some authors find it very difficult indeed. So there are real losers who could be fantastic quality writers but really don't have the skills or the interest in building up the markets in that way. So it can be very difficult for authors. John Mitchinson, if I could bring you in, uh, co-founder of Unbound. I know you worked in what we might call the traditional publishing business uh, before. How do you think authors are coping with this idea that they've got to be on Facebook, they've got to be Googling, they've got to be, uh, you know, all things to all men in order to get the word out there? How do people find books now? Well, I think that's. I think it's. It's a challenge. It's always been a challenge, to be honest. And most authors I know have always. Uh, you know, most of them have had to work quite hard um, before the advent of all the all the social media and digital. But I think the answer is is you know that there will be. It will be different for different writers. Not everybody. But, it, but isn't it true, John, that there's a confusing amount of avenues out there now? I mean, we've got more ways of learning about books than ever before, but fewer places where the physical book sits on a shelf waiting for somebody to find it. And I, think that, and I think that is an issue because I think word of mouth has always been actually in the end the thing that really sells books. I mean, you know, if you look at the, the, the analysis of the, you know, whether review coverage or advertising works, it's generally what happens and you can see that with Fifty Shades of Grey. Word of mouth takes, takes hold uh, and you get a, a, a success from nowhere. And I think while I think Amazon have been very good at you know, milking that. They, they've become the place, the first place that people now go if they're looking for a book. It's not what you would call a community. You know, nobody goes to Amazon to hang out and, and to talk to other people. You go in to get the books at a reasonable price. You know they'll come the next day. So that leaves a lot of space, I think, for, for, other, for other avenues. I mean, what, what Pauls do, I, I agree, is, is, is brilliant. And I think that the, the role of traditional booksellers is not going to evaporate overnight. It really isn't. But I think physical discussion, people handling books, people talking about books face to face, meeting authors, huge part of what literary festivals are about, about that connection, that direct connection with authors. And that's something I think traditional publishers have not been good at doing because traditional publishers don't sell directly to readers. They sell to retailers. They're always at one remove from the people that they, they really, in the end, ought to be selling to. Is, is that true, Max Bollinger? I mean, are you finding as a modern publisher that you're spending a lot of time talking to retailers rather than readers? I would say that my time is split um, about 50-50. I do have to spend a lot of time with distributors and retailers. But I think this direct engagement is extremely important, especially now, because we, we know now there are so many avenues. And, and, and people now know that they can find exactly what they want, where in the past this was not possible. But now everybody expects absolutely what they want. They don't want anything that doesn't cater to every up need that they have um, when they sort of describe what they want to read. And in this kind of market space, we now need to narrow cast. There's this you know, um, comparison between broadcasting and narrow casting. So publishers need to learn how to do it. Other companies have learned how to do it. And publishers need to start uh, learning how to narrow cast and find those niche um, audiences and those specialist communities with interest in those areas and then publish directly to them and work with them engaging. Um, Jonathan do? Rupin, if I can bring you in, your web editor at Foils. This business of uh, people expecting to find what they're looking for, and they tend to buy books in a sense that they know they're looking for rather than uh, browsing, as you said, uh, as they did once upon a time. I wonder if we can think about how difficult it is for the reader now. Um, you've got to be a part of these communities. You've got to be receptive to the people who are narrow casting at you. Isn't there just physically less time for most people to think about books and where they get them and find the time to even read about books, let alone read books? Yes, I think that's true. So as a retailer, you have to make it as easy as possible for them. Um, one thing we've, we've found uh, at Foils is we often have themed promotions in our front of house areas. You, you have a table, you can fit 30 or 40 titles, you, you have translated fiction or you have books about a particular topic or um, uh, books from a, a particular country. And people will try new things so long as you include on that table four or five titles that they will recognise and they will have widely seen and they may well have read before. Then people are curious. People are a lot more intelligent and a lot more curious than they're given credit for. And so long as you give them a little bit of guidance, then they, then they, will, then they will continue to diversify in terms of their reading. You do have to make it simpler. At Christmas particularly, when 
people who don't come into bookshops so much may, co may come in more. Uh, one of the tricks is to make your front of house area into an area where you can find a gift for absolutely anybody in that front of house area without having to deal with the thousands and thousands of titles that there are in a bookshop. And that can genuinely be quite intimidating. Do you think that's a, a problem, Max Bollinger? Why are people buying books? Are they buying books because they want to read these days or are they buying books because they think they should read them or are they buying books as presents? Oh, I think it's everything, really. And there's also um, education and um, science and medicine. There's all sorts of, there's a wide range of books, and they're used for different purposes, uh, from education to entertainment. So, it, and it's always a wider a range of books, but presumably fewer of them selling as as in in the numbers that they once did. Oh, when it comes to trade, of course, yes, few of them are selling. Um, but this um, is largely due to the fact that um, now we have so many different types of entertainment and consuming information, and that's something that's a new phenomenon that's not something that we had in the past books were primary source of information and entertainment um, in the past now we have so many different electronic means there are all these electronic communities this film this TV this podcast this I mean and it's growing so the number of channels is growing so so uh, the resources and readers attention allocated to books specifically will be going down it's just a natural process because we have so many channels I did read a study recently uh, admittedly this is about the United States but that suggested that book reading in the United States had dropped by 7% in the last 20 years. Now, given the amount of alternative media and other forms of entertainment that have become mainstream in that time, I think that shows that books are holding up remarkably well. Oh, I agree. I agree. This is a very important thing. But one thing I wanted to add to our, our previous discussion about what it takes now to bring new authors and new books onto the market. I, for example, had to go out and meet street artists in Brick Lane because one of our recent titles is about street artists, about art, how art influences human life. And in order to generate this interest and in order to bring this book into the place where it's most probably going to be of, of great interest and, and to, to the communities that are you know, part of this book and part of this story, I had to go out and meet the actual street artists. I had to make friends with them. I had to talk to them about this book because this writer is from Russia and he's writing about the Russian community of street artists there. But to, to introduce the book, I actually had to personally do it because um, Pavel Kostin, that's his name, he's in Kaliningrad, so, so he's not here, he's not able to do it. So the pressure is on me, on the publisher. And I, and I probably have to admit that not every publisher would go to such length and extent, and the, you know, it's a luxury. But obviously, the people I met, they, they appreciate this effort so much that um, the book becomes a lot more um, dearer to them, and, and they do take interest and they start reading it. So there's all these innovative ways of engaging with people when they become a little bit ap apathetic. I think we can admit that you know audiences overall are a little apathetic. There's so many channels thrown at them, they, they don't know what to choose sometimes, and then they're a little lukewarm towards everything. Let, let me bring in uh, Nicola. Nicholas Solomon from the Society of Authors. Are your members reinventing themselves? Are they exploring every channel or are they sitting in their garrets uh, getting depressed? Well, I think there's some of everything. We are very concerned to make sure that book <coughs> bookshops are supported um, so that people really see the range of books. And we are teaming up actually with the Book Association to support independent bookshops and there'll be quite a lot of author events coming up and author comments on that and I think authors are very good at inventing different ways some connecting directly with their audiences um, doing the things that they're skilled at but but they do have to do more and do it in different ways there's no doubt about that on the other hand it's a very exciting time for people who do have good ideas because you can quite cheaply quite directly contact an audience if you want to um, John Mitchinson with Unbound. Uh, tell us a little bit about your publishing model, because if I'm right, uh, you set up Unbound because you were a little bit disillusioned with traditional publishing. All the discussion that we've been having, in a way, is about how do you sustain a really vital ecosystem of, of, of good writing? You know, uh, it's not enough, I think, just to talk about giving people what we think they want. That's, tradi that, that's in a way, where the the traditional media has got to. It's much easier to publish genre, uh, fi genre fiction, crime fiction, than it is to, to try and break a new and interesting literary novel. But, you know, I'm excited to say that we just this morning have funded, 100% uh, funded Charles Fernieho's wonderful uh, literary novels, the first literary novel that we've done through the, the model. And the idea really is what you're, what you're off offering people is the chance to be at the beginning of something. 
to, to make a small investment to, to make a new work of, of fiction or non-fiction happen. So it, that's, it that's because, if I can explain to the listeners, that's because you are getting people to put up money for titles that they think they want to read. Yes, at a, at a different level, of, uh, at various different levels. I mean, and that's, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's turning readers into patrons. It's also... Um, you know all this, uh, this this idea of trying to find new 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 markets for writing and, and audiences for writers. Yes, it does put some. I guess it does put the you know the, the more effort the author puts into doing that, the more immediately rewarded they are. It's also it's a very old fashioned model. It's what in the 18th century when Dr. Johnson wanted a dictionary, or the the early 19th century with with writers like Dickens, subscription in advance, getting getting your readers to put up the money to produce the book that then can be sold, you know, through through the trade. Is 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 is, 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 is I mean that's we're just using the internet to to make that process vastly more efficient but when you consider that you know only one in five books now earns back its advance a quarter of the books the physical books that are printed each year are, are, are pulped and destroyed you know publishing has been traditionally a very wasteful uh, industry it seems the chance now of, of, of actually being able to fund a much broader range of work in relatively small print runs it doesn't cost you know we only need a few hundred readers to pledge for a book to, to get it into print um, so I mean, while I think it will offer established authors a bigger, a bigger cut of the, of the pie than they're getting through traditional publishing contracts, it also offers first-time writers a, a, a way of getting into print more easily than the traditional route, which, as most people will know, it's almost impossible to get an agent, and even when you've got an agent, it's almost impossible to get a book deal. OK, John Richardson, sounding quite positive there about the future of making and selling books. We'll have to leave it there. But finally, Jonathan Rupin from Foils, I think you were founded in 1903. Are you going to be there in uh, 2103? Yes, yes, I, I think foils and bookshops generally will be around for some time to come, although the market will, will change radically in many ways. And Max Bollinger, you obviously think there is a future for you. Yes, traditional model, um, it may not necessarily be the most efficient, but it actually works for me. But, but I really cater specifically to certain audiences, and I know who they are, and I, I deliver products they want. I, I, I take great care uh, putting my new um, writers through extensive reviews process. Um, reviewers come from all, all countries of the world. They come from book clubs, from, from um, newspapers, from uh, literary organizations. So, so all that work is very, very important, and, and this has a long history. I, I just want to give this example to listeners. Dickens, for example, in order to get his books well, um, out, and he's one of the greatest writers of all times and one of the most um, uh, widely read um, writers now in English language, he had to go to small theatres and do book readings. And he, had, he was reading entire, sometimes hundreds and hundreds of pages of his own work. This is how he was promoting. He was also making copies of his um, original scripts by hand. And a lot of his novels go to 500 pages easily. So um, writers who, who were successful in the past, they put so much effort and so much energy into their work in the past. So, so those who, uh, who, for example, don't succeed now, yes, we can argue that there are so many channels and so difficult and confusing. But those who do make this huge effort and those who go out and meet the readers and g get their stories out to them, they will see rewards and they will engage and they will succeed. So I think that's the model. And if you put effort, if you do it passionately, if this is your passion and you know what you're doing, you will succeed and you will be there in, in 200 years' time, um, just like Dickens, who celebrated 200 years this year. I'll let the last word go to Nicola Solomon on behalf of your members, the Society of Authors. They've got to work harder, it seems. Uh, they do, but, I, but authors will still be there. I think there's this huge passion for writing about. There's a huge passion for reading. It may be delivered differently. It may be imprinted directly onto our brains. But I think that authors will find ways to deliver great books to people, and people will still be reading them. Nicola Solomon from the Society of Authors, John Mitchinson, founder of Unbound, Max Bollinger from Interactive Media, and Jonathan Rupin, web editor at Foils, Thank you very much for joining us today.